Today, I want to talk a little bit about this whole idea that God functions in rest. Now, in uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, it says there, And on the seventh day, God entered his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Okay, now this is a very interesting scripture. Now, let's just think for a moment. Do you think God is inside time, or do you think he's outside of time? Okay, so in the realm of the spirit, it's really a timeline of events, not as much as we have time here on the earth that is minutes and seconds and every minute and second that you waste is wasted forever uh, you can't move back and forth on this timeline you're kind of stuck right where you are but the moment you enter into the spirit then you're not limited by uh, material and by time like you are in your physical body and so therefore there is a spiritual meaning to time and there is a physical meaning now if you just think for a moment about six days of work so it says there that God said he rested from his labor. So he worked for six days and he rested the seventh day. What does the six, what does that word six means? Now, six usually refers to uh, the works of the flesh, uh, our labor, what we physically do uh, with our body, uh, the natural realm. You know, six has a, sometimes a very negative connotation uh, to that. Uh, but remember, everything that God created as a redemptive purpose and so the devil always twists uh, things and makes makes it uh, put his darkness in it and makes it evil uh, but remember every single thing is holy before the lord and so if ye worked for six days there's a reason and so the six talks about labor sweat effort uh, taking the creativity and the supply of god and doing something with it when god set out to create the heavens and the earth he worked for that six days uh, to build it uh, but in him he already had the blueprints and the plan of what he wanted to see manifest in this earth and so that's why he could speak it now you can only really speak something that you have a clear picture of that you can put your faith on so that you can bring what's in your heart and this inner spirit through your soul and release it uh, into this realm remember the story where the sower sows the seed Okay, so the seed uh, is something that he hear, but it's also something he understands. It's also something that he believes in his heart. So it's kind of the same thing in that process of creation. And so um, in the government of rest, uh, the six days represents uh, the mandate that God has given to us and then the obedience. Now, if you think about obedience, obedience is another word for saying, uh, activating my faith to manifest. So maybe we can say that could be a definition of obedience. Obedience is activating your faith to manifest what God has shown you. So God shows you a hope. A hope is a picture. Uh, then you take responsibility for it. And then when you take obedience, you take action to manifest through faith the picture that God has shown to you so it can manifest in this realm. And so that's what happened in the six days. And that's what the work of the six days is all about remember god is always working the scripture says we are co-laboring with god so working is a good thing and that's all that the six is about you know six is also a picture of the priest um the, the priest uh, is like that uh, uh, managing that relationship between god and heaven and us and bring that supply of god into uh, this earth and so six is about manifestation okay now we have uh, the one day or the seventh day which is rest um, and so it talks about rest in God rest in God simply means God is control and you trust him and um, one of the ways how the rest uh, in God is expressed is through thankfulness so I want to encourage you even when you have your normal Sabbath rest you know what we typically as a family do we start our week uh, on a Sunday at Living Word Church. Uh, we are there, we minister the Word, we 
uh, are part of the teams, the worship team, the prayer team. Uh, we minister to the people. We are there to, to do that. And then that's how we start our week. And then we go through the week. Uh, uh, Mondays, uh, we got our prophetic team training. We got in the evenings the live ministry. And then through the week, we have various opportunities where we pray for people. Uh, we have our church uh, leadership meeting uh, on Tuesdays. Uh, and then in between all of this, I, I make some of the teaching videos that I release on Unity with Heaven. Uh, on Thursdays, me and Pastor Jack spend the whole day. Uh, we preach. Uh, we uh, we uh, I preach first in the morning to the the, the school kids. Uh, we usually do two services, and then after that, then me and Pastor Jack pray for staff, and we pray for people that need prayer. And usually, the Lord always leads people over our pathway that we need to pray for. So that's uh, Thursdays, and then Fridays. Uh, we are back here. Then again, we got the Friday night service at Golov Church here in Paris. And then after the service, we do our prophetic teams. And so after that, prophetic teams is done on a Friday night. On that Saturday, then I just take a day where I say, well, I've been this week. I mean, my week is from the morning till the evening, most of the days. Uh, and then that Saturday is is me and the kids. Usually we go for a little breakfast at one of the restaurants here. Uh, maybe we go and walk by the river. Um, we'll play a game, sleep in the afternoon. And then maybe three, four o'clock, I'll put on the fire and we'll cook some food. And we'll just be thankful and celebrate the amazing things that God has done for us as a family. And we'll celebrate one another. And so that's kind of my week. So when I go on that seventh day, uh, Friday night when we're done here with the prophetic teams, then I make a conscious decision to enter into a period where I just rest. And the way I express my rest is through thankfulness. Okay, so that's very, very important. <laughs> now I gave you my whole week. Uh, and then um, uh, another way how we then can also express the rest is through making the crease. Uh, so you rest instead of working, you just decree and see how the Lord let his words come to pass. He said, none of your words will fall to the ground. So when we declare the words of God and we put faith behind it, then he will fulfill uh, those words. And then another way is also to praise him. So you got decrees and then praise is just a higher level. You, you add action with your decree and you decree and, and you glorify the Lord through your praise. So there's kind of a little bit of idea of the six days and the one days and you need both in your life. You need to have the time where we minister and also the time when you rest. You can't just have the rest but you can't just have the work. You need both of them. Now, um, the it's interesting that the rest day is on the seventh day. Uh, so and that means fullness complete. That's the, the number seven. Uh, now what's interesting um the Romans, what they did, they said the first day of the week, uh, they must offer that uh, as a sacrifice to the sun god. And so what they did, they said, okay, this, the first day of the week is the Sunday. And so the Sunday, that word Sunday, comes from the Roman, Greek, um, Latin uh, name that they say, this is a day of worship to the sun. And so that's why they actually call it Sunday in English. Uh, because that day was dedicated and so but the the christians and the jews they said no 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 we are going to uh worship god at all days actually what they did they worship god on every single day except for the rest day on the sabbath day they never went to the synagogue um they sat at home they tried to eat two meals good meals and just rest and just be thankful what god has done and so there was this conflict and so what they ended up doing, they said, well, Friday evening, 6 o'clock, we'll start the, the Christian Sabbath uh, and the Jewish Sabbath. And then on the Sunday, we'll have the first day of the week, uh, a day of rest for all the, the pagan guys that worship the sun. And then Monday morning, the second day, then everybody must start to work. And so that's where our weekend came from. It's not very godly. That's why for me, the first day of work is Sunday. Okay. Now, I'm not making a, a law of that. We Remember, we're not under the law. We're under grace. Uh, we are led by the Holy Spirit, and that's our obedience uh, to Him. Okay, so seven means fullness, completeness. Now, we talked about the six days, and we talked about the one day. Now, what's interesting, there's two thrones. The throne in your heart, the throne in heaven. And I want to kind of compare these two thrones also with the six days and the one day. The time of labor, 
uh, and you know obedience, uh, fulfilling the mandate, and then that time where we trust the Lord and we function in His rest. Now let's first start with the throne in our heart. Uh, so in your heart is a throne, and um, the idea is that Jesus has to be the Lord of your your life. So He sits on the throne, and you sit in Him, and so you come under the lordship of Jesus. So the whole idea of lordship of Jesus is He's the strategist. He tell you what to do, uh, and your function is obedience to Him. Now let's go to that rest of God. Um, and so um, Jesus' throne is in heaven. Jesus is seated on the right hand of the Father as a king. So in our heart, he's sitting as a lord. It means there is obedience. In heaven, he's sitting as a king. It means there is supply. Where does supply come? From the king. Where does stewardship come from? From the Lord. So Jesus is sitting as a king. We are seated in him in heavenly places, also as kings. Now, when God made Adam, he said to him, I want you to tend and keep the garden. Okay, that was the function uh, of kingship. And remember, the Lord gave Adam dominion. So he was a king. So his kingly function was uh, to bring supply, number one. Number two, to cultivate. That means to to uh, tend uh, and then to protect. That means to keep. Uh, cultivate can also mean to improve. Uh, and protect can also mean to provide a covering. So as a king, you're going to give supply. You're going to cultivate. That means you're going to improve whatever comes into your hands. Uh, and then you're going to protect it and you're going to cover it. And so out of us flow then this kingship that has to do with supply, cultivate, improve, protect, and the spiritual covering that he provides to us. And so all our supply comes out of heaven. All of it. Uh, but it doesn't help you have the supply of heaven, uh, but you don't put the, the words of, uh, the acts of faith, the obedience uh, to that. So that's why you need the, the supply and then you need the, the execution, the manifestation of that on this earth. The rest of God is about the absolute power, dominion, authority and influence of the presence and person of God functioning and flowing through you to bring divine order in and around your life in every arena and sphere of influence. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11 verse 28. For we who have believed do enter that rest. Hebrews 4 verse 3. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Hebrews 4 verse 9. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Hebrews 4 11. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Exodus 33 verse 14. A kingdom that is in darkness refers to a kingdom that God created, but it is now in darkness and under the control of darkness. This is not a kingdom of darkness since Satan did not make it. The kingdom of the spirit realm was in light under the authority of Adam, but through deception the kingdom was taken away from Adam and is now in darkness. That is why it is called the kingdom that is in darkness. If I am at rest, the darkness that tries to penetrate my life comes into divine order and there comes a peace. The darkness does not have a choice when you sit on a place of governmental authority, on your seat of the government of rest, on your mountain, exerting divine order into the chaos that exists in a kingdom that is in darkness. God gave Adam a mandate to rule as a king and to bring the divine order of heaven into earth. Here is that mandate. Genesis 1 verse 28. Then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. You might ask the question, what do I get to rule? What is the, the part of the kingdom on this earth? What is the measure of my authority and the dominion that God is giving to me and is raising me up to walk in? as a son of God and it's actually easy to know because we can look at the dominion that God gave to Adam and also the dominion that God gave to Jesus and then we can kind of get a clue of what God wants us to rule and reign in so uh, Genesis chapter 128 it says here uh, this is now the mandate that God gave to Adam he said to him be fruitful and multiply fill the earth and subdue it have dominion. That's now Genesis 1 28 and then in the very next verse then he starts to explain. So he starts here with uh, that the first dominion was given over the fish of the sea. Now when you think about fish of the sea uh, there's a natural meaning that's the fishes and uh, we just saw a big old fish <laughs> jump in out of the river uh, but then there's also uh, the spiritual significance of fish. Now fish is always 
a picture of supply, especially financial and monetary supply. If you think about the fish in the Nile, Pharaoh controlled the fish and that's why he could control the Israelites. You know, when um, uh, Peter needed money, they would go and fish. When they needed money to pay their taxes, Jesus said, go and catch a fish. In a fish will be a hook. No, the, 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 uh, in Jerusalem, uh, the second gate that was restored was the fish gate. The first one was the sheep gate. That's for the sacrifices. But the second gate that was restored by Nehemiah was the fish gate because that's the control of the supply, the financial customs uh, that, uh, through which the fish that was caught in the, in, uh, in the lake there was brought into Jerusalem. And so therefore, uh, the first dominion that God gives us, and it's interesting, it doesn't say he gave them first dominion over the land animals or first over the birds. The first one was the fish. And so therefore, God gives us dominion over resources. And so therefore, when you sit on your seat of authority, you say, Lord, thank you that you give me, have given me dominion over the fish of the sea, the fish at the supply, the financial supply. And so, Lord, I take that seat of authority and, and then you can start to rule and have dominion over that uh, gate. Okay? Uh, the second area was the birds of the air. Okay? So now the birds of the air is the spirit realm that's around the earth. And it's those seats of authority that God has destined for the sons of God to take authority over. And so therefore it's very important that you're going to have to have Jesus sit in the throne of your heart. You are seated in Jesus in heavenly places, in uh, the throne of the Lamb, in the robe of God. And then thirdly, that you then take a seat. So that means the Lord's going to give you a mandate to remove a principality from the seat that you are supposed to sit on. And then you need to go and sit on that seat and rule and have dominion. So that means you're going to have dominion over the, the atmosphere around you. Okay, that's the second one. And then the third one uh, was the everything that uh, everything that moves on the earth right and that is the physical manifestation of uh, what is manifested around your life uh, uh, you know things like poverty uh, is just a sign that the sons of God are not sitting on their place but when there is prosperity and when there is peace and there is law and order then it shows that the sons of God are taking authority so your your mandate is over the supply of finances over the the spirit realm and over the manifestation of natural things around us so god has given us total authority and dominion and so in order for us to shift into that position we need to come into the same frequency we need to come into unity with his government in our lives then we can bring his government into this earth Everyone wants rest. When I sell that whole idea to people to say, you know, you're going to work until you're 65 years old and then you're going to retire, buy yourself a house at the golf estate and then you can play golf every day and you can watch TV in the evenings and have a nice meal and you can just be at rest. And that's the, the dream that's being sold. Um, but here's the thing. You will never enter into rest unless you are seated on this government seat of rest that God has for you. And you'll never sit on that seat unless you surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. Now, the moment you sit in Him and He sits on the throne of your life, both here and in heaven, then actually what happens, the rest of God will not only be in your life, in your heart and in your mind, but it will penetrate every area of your life. It will go into your finances. Your finances will go to a place of rest. It will enter into your uh, family life, into your ministry life. It will enter into uh, your thoughts. Um, it will enter into relationships that you have in your life. And so you'll experience complete rest. Once you are seated in rest, everything in and around your life will come into alignment with the government of God. As a king seated in Jesus on your throne, you are a government of God. That means that you are an extension of his mountain and the supply that flows out of him. And so in heaven, uh, there is a mountain where Jesus sits 
and out of that mountain flows the river and the full supply and so that that looks like a river it looks like a supply channel uh, and that is then going to flow into your life who is also a mountain and then out of your mountain it's going to flow into the natural and spiritual uh, uh, environment around you and that river of god is so powerful and so full of life everything in your life will change uh, the lord is breaking limitations off of your life and the only reason why you have limitations is because the supply that you draw from is limited but the moment you draw from a supply that's unlimited then there's no reason why there, sh there should be any limitations whatsoever on your life i was laughing the other day i saw a little video clip here on youtube and that guy explained how poor Jesus was. You know, if you listen to him, he, he kind of explained that Jesus was so poor, he was actually like, uh, you know, a bum that was there on the street. He had like literally nothing. He's like 100% poor. <laughs> okay. And then the scripture that he used to explain how poor Jesus was, he used this one in Matthew chapter 820. Okay. So um, I'm going to read it to you. It says there, And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no way to lay his head. Okay, so now that's the, <laughs> the scripture that they use. Now, um, I thought, let's just quickly talk about it. What is Jesus talking about? So he says, foxes has holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Now, what do you think foxes do in holes? That's their house. That's the place where the male and the female fox would lay together. That's where they would have their babies. They would grow their family. Uh, that's the place where they will be safe and protected. And they'll have uh, their place of, of, you know, of government in their lives. Okay? Uh, then if you think about a bird again. Okay, so a bird would make a little nest. And then once they made their nest, then they would go into that nest and they would lay their eggs there so they can multiply. Now Jesus said, you know, the foxes has a place where they can multiply, the, the birds has a place where they can multiply, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So what he's talking about, his head is his rulership, is his lordship, is his kingship, the dominion that the Lord has called him to function in. And so the Lord, he said, he needs a place to lay his head. Now what happens when you say to Jesus, Jesus, this kingdom that's inside of me, is a place where you can come and lay your head where you can come uh, become the king and the lord in my life you can sit on that throne of authority in my life the moment you do it then he can multiply his kingdom in your life that means uh, the rule the reign the supply everything will just explode in your life the moment he is on that seat of lordship now it's not just simply saying a prayer and say jesus will you please be my lord but it's actually him sitting on the throne, you aligning every area in your life to his lordship and then being in a place of communion with him and say, Lord, I'm going to be an uh, executor of your orders and of your plans and of your strategy. Now, a lot of people ask this question, what is my purpose in life? Where am I going? But what they actually need to do, they need to say, Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. And so I'm aligning my life right now with your purpose and with your plan. And I'm an extension of your government on this earth. You do not have to sin. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. 1 John 3 verse 9. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. 1 John 5.18 The more you become one with God, the more the light and glory of God will stream out of you to fulfill the purpose God created for you. It is according to your belief how you think and who you identify with. You are born of God, so your spirit man is made new, but your mind has to be renewed. On whatever you focus and to whatever you surrender, you will build a throne in your life and your heart. When you think about the things of God, you focus on that and allow the presence of God to captivate your heart. Then you will not sin. 
When you are unwilling to surrender the throne in your heart to God and set your mind on things above, then sin has an open door to captivate your thoughts and desires and build a throne of sin to those things in your life. Notice in 1 John 3 verse 9, it uses the words born of God. That word born means being grafted in, to be knitted in, to become one with. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17. Begotten of God means to carry the DNA of God. Now the more we spend time with God, the more we draw from him, the more we walk in the spirit, the more the DNA of God that's in our spirit man will penetrate into our soul and into our body so that we will completely be renewed and transformed to start to glow with the glory of his presence as he sits upon us and we are we are changed all right so now i've got a question for you where do you think is the dna of god in you you know when you gave your life to the lord then you were born out of him and you received these genetics and his dna in your spirit man and so where do you think that DNA is resonant? Think about the tabernacle. There's an outer court, there's an inner court, there's a holy place, and in the holy place is the holies of holies. That's a place where the glory of God is. Your body, your spirit, your soul is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so just like the tabernacle is set up, also on the holy of holies, that's where your, the, the glory of God is dwelling inside of you, and then there's your holy place, that's your spirit. And then there's the, the soul, is the inner court. And then the outer court is your body. And so the DNA of God, along with his glory and his presence, and really the gate to the river that's in heaven, is in your spirit, man. There is a place in your spirit that is a holy place where the glory of God dwells. And when Jesus is your first love, then you open up uh, your, your spirit so that your spirit can be flooded with that glory of God that contains the DNA and the record of God and the record of who God created you to be. And then you can allow that to flood every gateway of your spirit, every gateway of your soul, and the gateways of your, your physical body. And you can start to glow with the presence of God. Now I want to read you a few scriptures here. It says here in Proverbs 4.23, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of love. Okay. Here's another one. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. Ephesians 6 verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places and then we got john chapter 1 verse 5 and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it so what actually happens that light is the glory of god it's in you in your soul and your body and sometimes a little bit in your spirit can be a measure of darkness but when you open up your gateway of first love in you and you open up the gates of your spirit, then the light that's inside of you can start to shine and it can drive out all the familiar spirits and all the darkness, all the images and things that's in your life. And that's why the scripture says the blood of Jesus, that word blood can also mean light, uh, washes away all our sins and even our conscience and our, the images in our imagination. That's, that's amazing. So instead of of fighting to be holy and fighting to be a son and to do what God is calling to you just become holy and just become a son of God just be that and so how are you going to be that you have to open up that gate because his DNA is going to infiltrate his light, his glory it's going to flow, it's going to change everything so I know a lot of people love worship and I can tell you what when you worship, don't worship just on a body and a soul level and maybe a little bit on a spirit level. But when you worship, open up the gates of your heart, open up your gate by first love and allow and, and, and come into the frequency of the resonance of you being seated in a throne that's in heaven and you being seated in Jesus sitting on your heart let those two thrones 
resonate with each other so that the robe of God can start to flow through you. And then when you worship, it's not only going to be just an awe about God, but there's going to be a flow of His glory. It's going to fill the whole temple where you are. So in the scripture, when the priests went in to worship the Lord in a temple, the whole temple was filled with the glory of the Lord so that the priests couldn't even stand. And so how did that glory come in there? The glory came through the gates in their hearts because they were just completely in love with God and they wanted to worship Him. And so the whole area was filled with the glory of God. You know, when we go and worship at church, some people come there all filled They've worshipped through the, the, the week. There's a resonance and a vibration between the throne in heaven and the throne in their heart. And so when they start to worship, the whole room full with the glory of God. The other ones come in there, they're still thinking about their work. There's no resonance going on. And all they do, because they can't draw from the supply in, in heaven, they draw from the supply that's flowing out of the other saints. Now that's fine for a time. But as you grow up and you mature as a son of God and as a daughter of God, it's time for you to be that guide. So that when you go and worship, you are the one that fill the room with the glory of God. And everyone else that, that are not at that level can then draw and enjoy the presence that actually flow out of your life. I know there's times where we pray and ask the Lord to rain down and He does it sometimes. But that is not the original plan because He didn't actually wanted to use angels and uh, other means and portals to bring his glory into this earth he wanted to use humans that can open up their gates and release the glory of god in revelation chapter 2 we see how there was a mighty rushing wind they were in unity together for 10 days and then the Holy spirit was poured out the reason why there was a portal for the glory of god to be poured out on them is because the brethren was dwelling together in unity they were in one accord in one place and so that uh, you know unity commands blessing and so because they were in unity uh, there was a portal for the blessing of God to be poured out on them which was the the baptism of the Holy Spirit but now once you are baptized in the Holy Spirit you don't have to dwell together for 10 days to give it in order just to open up a portal I can tell you what if you want the glory and revival of God in your church why not Dwell together in unity because the glory is going to fall from the portal above the church and it's going to come through the gates, through uh, the people that, that engage the Lord both in heaven and on this earth. And so, I mean, this whole earth is going to be flooded with the glory of the Lord. And the Lord wants to use you to do that. So, this is a note that I wrote down from what Ian Clayton said. He said, instead of fighting, you should become something. So, instead of striving to be something just become something the only way you're going to become something is through the dna of god the glory of god is in you that streams and flows out of your life god bless you thank you so much for joining us please like and subscribe and we'll see you in the next video